Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm Charles Shapiro, President of World Affairs Council. Today's program is with John Selden, General Manager of Hartsfield Jackson, Atlanta National Airport. Our program today is brought to you by the UPS Foundation and by you, the members of the World Affairs Council. We've got some members of the Consular Corps, Anat Sultan Dadon, the Consul General of Israel, Aishatu Aliyah Musa, the Consul General of Nigeria, Peter Zimmerle, Consul General of Switzerland, and a bunch of other really important people. John Selden is for another day and a half, the general manager at Hartsfield Jackson, the world's busiest and most efficient airport. He oversees airport operations as well as the capital improvement program. Became general manager in October, 2018. John is a former Navy and commercial airline pilot. In March, John announced that he is leaving to become CEO of Neom Airport in Saudi Arabia on the Red Sea coast. So. Welcome, John. It's great having you here. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, just, uh, just a really um, transition for me. You all are so much more important to me now than I'm going to be in Saudi Arabia um, and be an international uh, uh, airport. So uh, it's going to be very interesting going forward here uh, in dealing with not just domestic, but really focus on international and international travel going forward, because that's the, the purpose of uh, NEOM is to uh, connect the world to that side of Saudi Arabia. So well, you're very excited. Well, we're excited to have you. We had, we had you speak, I want to say, almost a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, just as uh, Hartsfield Jackson was shutting down operations because of, because of COVID, has air travel after COVID changed forever? Good question. I, I, I think when the only thing I think that will change forever is a little bit of the business travel. Mm -hmm. I think you're going to see, and we, we, you know, we have very few people in business suits, women or men in, in suits, and uh, most people are leisure travel right now. We have very few business travelers. So that um, piece of our business, which is usually someone on an expense account that spends money on significant money in our concessions and flies uh, quite a bit. Um, and parks their car in our gold parking and so on and so forth, that will affect our business. The scope or the percentage of the business that will be impacted, I'm talking once we get past COVID, right. uh, is, is, probably, is undetermined, but it will affect COVID, I mean, affect air travel. Um, after September 11th, and I, we, I flew a flight, I was flying for American Airlines, we flew a flight from Kennedy to Las Vegas, we had one passenger on the plane. Um, and then business travel was not happening because of video teleconferencing where you'd sit in a conference room. This is a little bit more intimate where you can actually have a business meeting or an introductory business meeting. But I still think you're going to need that human touch and go out to lunch and play around the golf or, or do whatever you're going to do uh, to connect with your clients and make sales and go further. Go, um, this is a great medium, but I don't know about you all. But I know at this point, after doing this for a year, that when I have 20 people on a call, I can tell you 10 to 12 are on their phone, looking down, yeah. they're doing other things, and they're listening, but they're not really engaged as if you were sitting across from them. So I, I think that part of our business, um, the initial business trip may change a little bit, and it'd be a little bit more cost effective for the businesses. They don't have to send somebody to make a cold call, and you know you, you don't even get to talk to the people you're looking for. Um, international travel, we feel confident, will come back and come back very strong, and uh, domestic travel is is just booming right now. So we had uh, Rafael Bostic, the CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, earlier this week, and he said he thinks things are going to go well between now and the end of the year. Thousand, pardon me, a million jobs a month are likely to be added to the economy. Um, when do you see things getting back to normal for international air travel? So, oh, so international air travel is going to be our last piece, I think, to come back besides that business piece that's not going to come back. I international travel, um, and again, I'm, I'm flying to Saudi Arabia on Saturday. Um, the hurdles that I have to go through to, to do that um, is, are quite significant. Um, and it makes travel very difficult, i.e. if you're going to the Dominican Republic, it's a piece of cake. Uh, you get a COVID test at your hotel and you show it when you land here, you're all set to go back in and out. Right. So you have some very tight uh, international destinations and some 
fairly uh, loose international destinations. And, and we are tr trying as hard as we can as airports. Uh, as a matter of fact, tomorrow I have a call with the CDC, uh, other airport CEOs, the FAA, um, our organizations to try to come up with some kind of standard. Um, and, and the standard we're looking at um, is to base it on the country. In other words, the country is red, yellow, or green. If you're in a green country, this is what you got to do. If you're going to a red country, this is what you got to do. But each country has, it's five days, it's 72 hours, it's three days, whatever, you have to get a COVID test. It's really confusing. So we really need to standardize that. Once we get it standardized, I think we're going to be in a good place to travel as the world gets their uh, vaccine. Before I got on this call with you, the CDC came out, it was just on TV, that they do not believe that if you're inoculated or the data is starting to show that if you're inoculated, you will not spread the virus. If that happens and we get herd immunity and we get, we get everybody inoculated, um, I think you're going to see this pent-up demand in international travel explode. But until that time, I think, you know, you're looking at international travel. We're, we're not, we're really looking at it in, uh, you know, towards the middle of 2022 to start really coming back. And hey, what about a, a, some sort of COVID passport, vaccine yeah. passport? How do you, how am I going to show? I'm, I'm traveling uh, to New York in a couple yeah. of weeks. I mean, how do I show the, the airline that I've, that I've had my shots? Yeah. So you have your card. That's about it here in the States. Yeah. Many other countries have it all digitized and computerized and so on and so forth. But this call tomorrow, we are trying to get our country, the federal government, the FAA and CDC to come on board with what is this going to be for the United States? And then once we set the standard, there's uh, IATA. Are you familiar with that? The yeah, of course. Yeah. So I, IATA has a, a passport now. Somewhere along the line, we're going to have to decide on what the standard is and what the database is to manage this. And once we do that, I think you'll see it on your on your phone or you can print it out uh, or um, whatever. But, I, you know, it is going to be this piece that still you're going to need this herd immunity to really uh, be effective, to stop the, the spread of the virus. And then I think we'll be in a much better place uh, going forward. But um, yeah, international travel is definitely gonna have some, some difficulties because as you know, you connect, I have to connect through a couple different places to get there. And once you're in an airport in one of those countries, your whole procedures change and things. So it's very difficult and we have to make it like it was simple. So how's Hartsfield Jackson doing? I mean, it's overwhelmingly, well, they're obviously international flights, it's overwhelmingly a domestic airport. Mm -hmm. um, how, how, how is it doing? Is it back to, how close to a normal, level, normal pre-COVID level of operations? So our, our planes, uh, right now, uh, last Sunday, we had 2,050 flights. Out wow. of, uh, some days 1,800, some days 19, um, and that's growing. Uh, we have one of our concourses closed. That's going to open in May. Uh, half of concourse C, excuse me, is closed. That's going to open in May. So the entire airport will be back open. Um, and right now we're running somewhere around 50 to 55% of our passengers that we saw pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. We are one of by far, we are by far the busiest airport with flights. And we are the busiest airport in the North America with passengers also. Our checkpoint this morning, uh, was something very rare I hadn't seen in a year. We were uh, backed out across the atrium and over by the Piedmont Park store over all the way by the John Lewis Memorial that we have in our atrium. And that was because many people, many, many people showed up early, much earlier than expected today. So we'll be ready tomorrow. We, we had 11 lanes open at uh, six o'clock. We, we needed them all open at six o'clock. So, mm -hmm. you know, the passenger is much, is not as, um, they don't think we're as dependable as we were. So they got, everybody got here for their nine o'clock flight at 5.30 in the morning. So we had a lot more people than we expected, but we'll work that out going forward. So we are recovering uh, pretty quickly now. Uh, March numbers are not out, but they're pretty good. I, we expect April to be probably 60 or 70% of where we were. So we're looking at somewhere, we're hopeful around 50 million passengers total. Uh, and we had 43 million last, last year, but don't forget in January and February of that 43, we had 17 million right there in those first two months. So we're going to spool back up and 2022 really will be the, I think the year for the full recovery or except uh, for the two pieces, the international and the business. Sure. C CDC, 
apparent research shows that being in the airplane is actually fairly safe. You know, the air circulation and the filtering and everything, but that it the the, the checkpoints and you know the, the the restaurants at the airport and all the stores at the airport and the plane train are people are jammed together there. How how have you modified those? So we have the social distancing markers, which all over the airport. Uh, we have hand sanitizers all over the airport, and we still have over 4 million masks, I think, here to hand out. So everybody's got a mask on, which is number one. Everybody's got a mask on. If you don't or you're wearing it improperly, hopefully somebody says something to you from my staff or, or a passenger, and most people forget that they, they take it off. So if everybody's wearing a mask and you're socially distanced, I think you're going to be okay. The checkpoint, I don't know if you've been to, but we have plexiglass in our main checkpoint um, to make sure we give you a little added uh, separation. Plus, you should stay six feet apart. Um, when people, and I should say, when humans get in a line here, they tend to bunch up even though they're not gonna get down any faster by staying apart, but they tend to bunch up, um, but we're doing that. The other piece, when you ride the plane train, personally, I walk, um, uh, I just walk. If I don't like what I see, I just walk. It, it's good exercise, it's five minutes between terminals. And a majority of our flights are on concourse T, A, and B. So if you're a domestic, you really don't have to walk, walk that far. If you're on F, you're right in. International E is quite a hike, but if you got to walk to E, but usually going that way, the trains are not full yet till they get over to concourse, at least to C, D, C, and and B. Then they're then the train fills up. So you, you most likely walk. Um, we're putting in all kinds of touchless technology. I think you know we're we're getting um, bag claims that you do yourself. Uh, it's going to look at biometrics on your face. Spirit is working on putting that in. Um, Delta will follow suit. Um, and then there's biometrics really will be the, the, the face of how do we not touch anything and go forward. Our new checkpoint lane, when you put your um, bag in the bin for the new South checkpoint, the bin goes, you don't have to touch the bin. Uh, it goes through the machine, it comes out the other side, you walk through, you pick it up out of the bin and the bin uh, parks itself and then goes down and goes back to the other end. If you leave something in the bin, it'll actually alarm as you walk by to tell you to get your stuff. So uh, we, we have the technology and we're looking to replace all of our um, ASL, all of our uh, checkpoints, the main and the north with the new technology and international, where, where we're talking about that today. So we're trying to do everything we can to keep everybody safe, but everybody wearing a mask is key, really is. And um, there's usually plenty of space if you wanna take your food to, a, to one of the, the whole rooms if you don't like the, the lines at the concessions, because we have plexiglass at the ticket counters at the check, the cashiers and we have social distancing markers, but I can tell you everybody wants their Chick-fil-A sandwich and they, they bump up, bump into one another. Of course. So tell us about the new job. I mean, where are you going on Saturday? Tell, tell, give, give us some details. So uh, I'm going to take off from here. I'm going to go to Dulles. I'm going to go to Dulles to Riyadh and the Riyadh I'm going to Tabuk, which is on the Red Sea coast of Saudi Arabia, just underneath Jordan. Um, Neom is a uh, new city that uh, the crown prince is uh, overseeing and building and funding. Uh, government is funded, I believe it's the estimate right now is a half a trillion dollars. And this is going to be the city that will um, <clears throat> compete with uh, Dubai or not compete, but do better. It will be carbon zero. Um, there'll be no cars. Uh, there'll be a hyperlink uh, from where the international airport is, because like I said it's the size of Denmark. So it's 170 kilometers from the international airport all the way to the end of the hyperlink. And there's another small airport uh, at that end, but it, I don't believe, I'm not sure it's hooked up to the hyperlink. I think it's a couple mi uh, miles away. And <clears throat> that airport exists, the runway is there now, it's a 9,000 foot runway. So we're gonna expand that terminal there to obviously support the construction and start some tourism and things in that area. The Red Sea is spectacular um, tourist attractions right across from Egypt. There's, there's planning for um, resorts and all kinds of things, but the city will focus on 16 sectors with I think six cities along the hyperlink um, that will go the 170 kilometers very rapidly. Um, and we'll have 50 million passengers or so in the International terminal at the on the western side, and the other terminal will be about a three million passenger airport. But the city will uh, be walkable, and it will have uh, wind power at night. 
and solar power during the day. And they're in the process right now of building a $5 billion green hydrogen, which means it's made with sustainable uh, energy to power everything else if the uh, other systems don't you know, cover it. So uh, hydrogen, uh, which makes water when you, when you utilize it, and uh, solar and wind, it's gonna be an amazing place. And it is going to be very um, carved out with its own set of uh, laws and, and uh, social norms uh, also. So it will be different, a little different than Saudi Arabia um, uh, going forward, but Saudi Arabia is transitioning very rapidly under uh, uh, the Crown Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman. So uh, what your job is running the airport, building the airport. Yeah. I mean, what, t t what specifically are you gonna be doing? So, so we're building five gates here on the T concourse right now. So we have a contractor do it. I, as the general manager, I oversee that development. So I am going to be the CEO of the airport development company that is going to oversee the construction of the Neon Bay Airport, the 3 million uh, passenger airport, and the international airport, the 50 million uh, passenger airport at the, about 100, 100 miles, 170 kilometers away. So right now we're, they're, they're in the process of design and getting forward. So my goal, obviously I come from uh, a very large hub that is incredibly efficient. And I have uh, over 30 years of aviation experience bring to the table to oversee the development, to make sure that it is incredibly efficient and that it works operationally, which is my forte uh, from a passenger customer experience perspective, from an airline perspective, from an airline pilot's perspective. Uh, I bring that to the table to oversee the development and design and uh, the construction of these facilities. And, and, and both airports, the, you don't who, who runs the hyperlink is that you or somebody else? no that will be that will be that. <laughs> no, no. i have enough trains i had a train at kennedy called the air train and i got two trains here um they uh they're they're the hyperlink i'm sure is definitely going to be a little difficult different than a train but no there there's a, a slew of the i'm, I'm going to say you know the world's the world's best people are, are being brought to uh neom to to do this uh, many many experts in their field and it will be a real um environmentally friendly project, incredibly environmentally friendly. So how, how long did you hesitate after they offered the job to you to accept? Um, I talked it over with my wife. I, I don't have any, my wife and I, we don't have any children. So I, I talked it over with my wife for quite a while because uh, she's not coming with me. Um, and it's not, uh, it's not like when I came to Atlanta, my wife stayed in New York for a while and Atlanta, New York is pretty easy, but um, Atlanta to, um, uh, to Neom is quite a, quite a trip, <laughs> but um, she's fully supportive. And, and uh, it took, it, it, we talked for about a week or two about it. Uh, tremendous opportunity for me here at, uh, at the end of uh, where, where I sit from today to go to actually start something that I can make my mark on. My entire career, even in the Navy, I, I was always involved in somebody else's infrastructure that we were trying to either upgrade or fix. This will be the first time I get to work on something from the, from the ground up. Do you get to do part of the design as well, or that's already I'll, done? That will be done by consultants, and there'll be numerous competitions for the terminal designs and things. But I will oversee the the process like I do here. I, I didn't get involved with the design of the gates and what the whole rooms would look like. Concepts are presented, and then we modify them with a, through a, and I'll have to go through a board for approval to get, make sure that the designs are right, then go make sure it's funded and then actually uh, be involved in getting the, the construction of it started. So if you fly on Saturday, when do you start work? On, on Monday. Monday. When you get there. We have Monday. Monday. Wow. Yeah. So how, let's go back a little bit. How do you compare running Atlanta to running JFK? I mean, two very different airports. Yeah. So, so Atlanta is um, one terminal, even though they're connected, it's still one operator. Um, I think we have 30 something airlines here, 35, it depends on the day. Um, at Kennedy, we had 85 airlines, uh, no real major carrier, even though Delta was, was the biggest there, but JetBlue and American and British and um, a bunch of international carriers, much more international than, than Atlanta. And that's why the piece is so critical that we stay with you all. Um, the international community in here in Atlanta, because we are a tremendous domestic airport, 
but we are not the international hub like I came from. And we could be because we have the capacity, we have the runway lengths, we have great connectivity to the rest of, the, the, of America and the United States and even to Canada, um, better connectivity than Kennedy has or LAX. It's just that we don't have the international travel here. So our focus with you all is to ensure that the international community, we, we work with you because we have enough domestic, we need to get an international flights here to bring that international piece to Atlanta and international business and international tourism. And we need to go with this great hub that we have here and feed the international community for tourists and business the other way. So our international piece is one of the most critical pieces as you look forward for Hartsfield Jackson to work on because domestically we're incredibly strong between Delta and Southwest and JetBlue and United and American. It's that international piece that we really have to focus on here to really grow Atlanta and grow our, our business and our tourism industry here. Bureaucratically, was it different? I mean, in, in New York, the Port Authority runs the airports, the ports, the yeah. World Trade. I mean, it's, just, it's a huge, gigantic operation. Yeah. In Atlanta, it's the city of Atlanta. Yeah. Um, is, 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 is that... Does that make a difference? They leave you yes. alone in both places or? How? No, <laughs> no, they, they, they never leave you alone. Um, but it is much, uh, you know, the Port Authority is owned by two, two states. The governor's appoint, uh, the chairman of the board is from New Jersey and the executive director of the Port Authority is from New York. And they both have different interests, obviously. And the Port Authority is that bridge that connects the tunnels and the bridges and the path train. Um, so there's always this pull and push. In the city of Atlanta, Mayor Bottoms has supported this airport for the good of the city. And we have one focus, the city, the state, and the region. And that holistic one voice, what is the best thing for Georgia and for the city of Atlanta is key to the success of this airport. You don't have different pieces pulling, pulling away. Um, approvals are great. We have great city council. We can go to city council. We, two weeks later, we get approval. The mayor signs it. We're on our way. A um, little bit different with the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. It's a review process. Secondly, um, the airport is uh, incredibly, um, uh, our business model makes us tremendously self-sustaining with additional dollars for reinvestment. Um, so we really don't need any help. We just need to do the right thing here. Uh, in the Port Authority, they actually take some money off the airports, which is why they kind of, some of them um, decayed to the state that they were at, that they now have to invest tens of billions of dollars to get Kennedy, LaGuardia and Newark back up to um, a, a certain level of, uh, uh, how do you say it, level of uh, customer experience. So what are, your, what are your greatest hits here in Atlanta? Oh, what, 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 are, what, what accomplishments are, are you proudest of? This year. Well, the first thing I was proud of when I got here in October, they said, oh, we have a Super Bowl coming in February. I was like, oh, oh my goodness. So we had a hundred and I don't know, 5,000 passengers at our checkpoint that day. We had a great plan. We had a great team. Everybody was happy except the LA Rams fans. And there wasn't too many of them back then. It was all Boston people. We, I mean, we showed that Hartsfield Jackson, again, our record was, I think, 90 something thousand prior to that. But we showed that we could take this airport up to 130 million passengers with those kinds of numbers if we could do that every day uh, and still be on time and be super efficient. Um, so that was a huge accomplishment in making that happen and, and bringing that, you know, your first impression when you land at an airport of a city is that airport. And I think we made a great impression on arrival and departure for the city of Atlanta. So, so that, that was it. Uh, we completed those canopies. That was really good. Um, uh, but really, I think I'm most proud of is our pandemic response. I mean, we are running like no other airport in the country right now. We didn't, we didn't go out and buy robots and do all kinds of things to, the, to uh, try to get people to come here. We deep cleaned this airport. It looks sterile. We put our, you know, everybody got on their hands and knees and scrubbed this place. We disinfected, we deep disinfected. You know, we did put plexiglass up, but we didn't want to make it so difficult uh, here to travel. We did everything we could. We had the support of the mayor and of the governor to keep Georgia open as much as possible. And I think what the team did by staying healthy, 
our team at the Department of Aviation and at the airport, you see in general, even, even across the sector, our percentages of COVID are much lower than the, the regular community. Uh, we Again, we had cleanliness, we had masks, we had all kinds of things going for us to keep this airport going. Plus we had great partners in Delta with the blockage of the middle seat. Um, mm -hmm. And that was a huge selling point to many people here. So our pandemic response was huge. The team stepped up. I have 800 mission critical employees here and about 250 that are um, out on um, uh, teleworking. Uh, but the team stepped up, did their job. They did it better than ever. And we won the customer service award last year for all of North America. I mean, come on. And we're the biggest, busiest airport in the, in, the, in the country. So, I mean, they just did an amazing job. I'm most proud of that. Um, we also stepped up cargo. We have four Amazon flights now. We're looking for a lot more as we build cargo. We finished the ATL West deck and that has Peach Pass in it. We're gonna open that up here in May and you're gonna drive in and drive out, no tickets. Uh, we completed the nine lanes of the South Security Checkpoint. So if you come here, all of our pre-check and clear pre-check are on the South side. We have brand new technology, CAT scan uh, devices. You don't even touch your bag as I described earlier. We got that pleated on schedule, a little ahead of schedule and under budget. So that's looking great. Um, and, and finally, we are taking that plane train, Charles, and we are making it 20, 20% 20 faster. And every night we blow up, but we have explosions underground. We're building a big tunnel so the thing can turn around much faster. And we're buying 14 cars. So we're going to increase that capacity by 20% without building another, really another lane of traffic. So that's going to, so we're fixing the parking, we're fixing the checkpoint, we're fixing the train. And oh, by the way, we're, the foundations are in for five more gates. So we're expanding Hartsfield-Jackson during a pandemic like nobody else. So we're really doing great and we're planning on the future and the future growth from 110 to wherever we can get to maybe 120, 25 million. So that's, that's what I'm most proud of. Uh, that, that's an amazing legacy that you're leaving. John Selden, I want to thank you so much. This, this has just been great. I know you're jammed. Um, I'm going to ask the audience to stay on. John, if you can stay, that's great. But uh, if you need to go, that's I, I, fine. I got I got I got I got to do a little advertising here for myself. We've got two programs coming up next week on uh, April 7th at noon, Building the Black Middle Class with John Hope Bryant. And then April 8th at noon, the Iran nuclear deal under Biden, should the U.S. rejoin or not, and under what conditions, with Ambassador Tom Shannon, former Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs, uh, and actually was acting Secretary of State for about a week and a half. Um, great guy. I have three requests for our audience, and for Hartsfield Jackson, by the way, join the World Affairs Council as a corporate member. We need y'all. We, 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 we need your support. Um, and uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's no charge. Invite your friends to join one of our programs. I want to thank UPS Foundation for supporting today's program. Alreen Richards Barr, Director of International Business at the airport, and her colleagues. Biko Weinberg, Director of International Relations and Chief of Protocol of Georgia. And our team, Valerie Lopez DeFrank, Laura Brower, Fernanda Lukini Shihara. John, thanks again. Appreciate it. And he's gone, but I'm going to be out there to visit him in Neom. It sounds fabulous. Uh, everybody, thank you very much. I will see you all next week. This has been great. Bye-bye.